So, hi everyone, and welcome to this third webinar in our Transatlantic Current series. It's a monthly webinar series that features American experts, and it's organized by the FIA Center on U.S. Politics and Power, together with our American friends. Today, we'll be talking about U.S.-Russian arms control. And I'd just like to remind everybody that the second part of this webinar is dedicated to your questions, which you can ask using the chat function. And you're more than welcome to type in your questions as soon as they arise. There's no need to wait for the Q&A to begin before you start typing them in. But without further ado, I'd like to hand the floor over to Leo Michel, who is non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and also a non-resident fellow here at FIA. The floor is yours, Leo. Thank you, Maria, and greetings from Washington. I'm pleased to introduce as our guest today, retired Ambassador Steve Piper. Steve is a William J. Perry Fellow at Stanford's Freeman Sporgley Institute for International Studies and a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. During more than 25 years as a career foreign service officer with the State Department, he focused primarily on US relations with the former Soviet Union and Europe as well as arms control and security issues. In addition to serving as ambassador to Ukraine from 1998 to 2000, he has served at the U.S. embassies in Warsaw, Moscow, and London, as well as with the U.S. delegation to the negotiation on intermediate range nuclear forces in Geneva and on the staff of the National Security Council. Steve, for those who have not had a chance to read your March 2020 article, which was attached to the invitation, could you briefly summarize the key benefits of New START and why, in your view, it should be extended, as the treaty allows, before its expiration date of February 5th, 2021? Well, certainly, Leo, but first let me say thank you to you and to Maria for having me today. Um, the New START Treaty lowers U.S. and Russian strategic offensive forces to levels that we haven't seen since the early 1960s. Uh, so I think it is very much in the U.S. interest. I think it's also in Russia's interest. Extension of the treaty for an additional five years, which the treaty would permit, would allow us to maintain the limits on Russian strategic forces for an additional five years. That seems to me very much in the U.S. interest. But moreover, that would also extend for five years the flow of information that the United States gets about Russian strategic forces from things like data exchanges twice a year, the sides exchange about 2,000 notifications about changes in their strategic forces each year, and the treaty allows eight, up to 18 inspections per year. And for example, when an American inspection team arrives at a Russian intercontinental ballistic missile base, the team is given a list showing the location of every deployed missile at the base and the number of warheads on each of those missiles. Uh, that's valuable information. Uh, if we lose the treaty, we stop getting that information. It's going to be more expensive to collect it. And some information we're not going to be able to get, even with very good and sophisticated national technical means. And this is information that right now the Russians just hand us. So we get those advantages, the limits on Russian forces, that flow of information, and it does not require the United States to make any changes in its strategic modernization plans, which are designed to fit within the limits of the New START Treaty. So I believe it was a mistake of the Trump administration not to extend the treaty for five years. Uh, the incoming Biden administration has expressed a readiness to extend the treaty. I think that's a good thing. Well, let me ask you, has Russia complied with New START? Now, it could be an obvious question, but I, I must ask it, because there have been some critics of New START who say there's been a pattern of Russian non-compliance with both conventional and nuclear arms control agreements, most recently, or most notably, I should say, their violation of the 1987 INF Treaty, which led to the U.S. decision last year to withdraw from that treaty. And as their, that is, as the critics would argue, if they violate on one or more treaties, what's uh, to prevent them? Why should we not expect them to violate them all? Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. The Russian pattern of observing treaties is problematic. Um, they violated the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty by deploying 
a ground launch cruise missile, the 9M729 of intermediate range, that's a problem. Uh, but at least so far, uh, they have complied with the new START treaty. Uh, the State Department does annual compliance reports. Uh, they report that Russia's in compliance. And, and again, one of the things about the new START treaty is it does have the verification measures in place that if there was going to be any kind of a significant violation, we should be able to detect that. So I also believe the Russians see it in their interest to maintain the new START treaty. Just as from the American point of view, it's good to have Russian forces capped and it's good to have the predictability about those forces. I think the Russians also value having predictability about the level of American forces. Uh, so thus far, they seem to be observing the treaty. And again, the verification provisions will tell us if there's a violation. So I, I think even though Russian behavior on other treaties is problematic, it still makes sense to continue with the new START treaty. So let me pursue something along those lines. In recent years, the Russians reportedly have modernized a major portion of their land-based and submarine-based strategic nuclear systems and may seem well on the way to deploy new systems such as uh, hypersonic delivery um, vehicles. And the U.S. has also begun to modernize, although somewhat later and at a more modest pace, our own strategic deterrent. In the event that New START were allowed to expire for whatever reason, would you foresee a very rapid and destabilizing growth in the nuclear arsenals and types of new delivery systems of, of both sides? Yeah. Well, the first point I make is both sides are modernizing in large part because they have aging systems. So my guess is that had the Russian military had the money back in the early 2000s, they would have begun their modernization program earlier. Um, and, and again, as you said, the Russia, Russia and the United States are on different cycles. So Russia is probably about 70 to 75 percent of the way through its modernization cycle. The U.S. is just now beginning in earnest its modernization. Uh, but if New START goes, my guess is you don't see a significant increase in the number of delivery systems because even without New START, both the U.S. military and the Russian military, I believe, face some significant resource constraints. Um, so there's not going to be a lot of money to do that wild buildup. What you may see, however, though, is, an, well, and you may not see it, but what may happen is an increase in the number of warheads on those delivery systems. Uh, so, for example, under the new START treaty, the American submarine-launched ballistic missile, the Trident D-5, it can carry up to eight warheads. But because of new START's caps on warheads, the average Trident is carrying probably only four or five warheads. Well, there are extra warheads sitting in a storage area somewhere, and the United States could choose to upload those warheads, to add those warheads. Uh, the Russians probably don't have as much capability to add additional warheads as the United States, but they're beginning to catch up. So there could be this creep up above the limits as size added warheads, but again, without the verification provisions of New START, neither side would know about it. Uh, and I think that's problematic. But it probably won't be a significant increase in the number of submarines and intercontinental ballistic missiles and submarine launched ballistic missiles, because both sides, I believe, face some fairly significant constraints on how much they can spend. So, um, to bring things up to date, last month, there were signs that there might be a possible breakthrough in U.S.-Russian talks. The U.S. seemed to drop its earlier insistence that, that China participate in the follow-on treaty with the U.S. and Russia, and I believe U.S. officials were openly pressing the Russians to press the Chinese to agree to that. Um, but U.S. officials were also insisting that the new treaty must include limits on intermediate and shorter range nuclear weapons where Russia does hold today a significant advantage over the U.S. In late no October, so this is really just a few weeks before the election, according to the U.S. Special Envoy for Arms Control, the Russians were close to accepting a U.S. proposal to extend the New START Treaty for one year, along with a cap on the number of all nuclear weapons, or warheads, I should say, that would be strategic and non-strategic warheads in each side's arsenals. But the Russians apparently balked ways to verify that cap. U.S. National Security Advisor of the outgoing administration now 
said that simply extending New START was not acceptable. So that's a quick summary of how I understand the state of place. So where do the two sides stand as of now on these issues, especially as we know, President-elect Biden will take office uh, on January 20th, and it's made clear that he would agree to a five-year extension of New START without a warhead cap, indeed, without preconditions. Yeah. Well, again, I, I believe it was a mistake for the Trump administration to not simply accept the Russian offer, which was to extend New START without conditions for five years. Uh, but at the end, uh, the final proposal that was on the table was that the Trump administration was prepared to extend the New START treaty for one year if Russia agreed to a freeze on all of its nuclear weapons levels. Now, th that could have been a breakthrough uh, if that suggests that Russia is prepared now to talk about all of its nuclear weapons, not just deployed strategic weapons. That would be very valuable. Uh, but I'm not sure Russia was prepared to do that. I think Russia was talking about simply a one-year freeze, and then the question of what might happen in the longer term was still open. Mm -hmm. I think the uh, Trump administration's demand for verification, though, was impractical. Uh, because you were talking about just a one-year freeze, there wasn't really time to do verification. And, and let me go by my own experience. Uh, I was assigned at the American Embassy in Moscow in the late 1980s. I had the arms control portfolio when the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty was signed. And that treaty provided for what we call perimeter portal monitoring at Votkinsk, which is where the Russians produced the SS-20, which was now prohibited, but they also produced some uh, permitted missiles. Uh, now, the treaty specified how that system would operate. However, it still took us seven months after the treaty was signed to get in place the procedures and the equipment and the people to make that happen. And in this case, you'd be starting from zero. So I just don't know how you would get verification in place. Um, now, I think at this point, you know, the ideas are pretty much dead. It seems to me that a big driver on the American side was the president's desire to have a foreign policy achievement before the November 3rd election. Uh, Ambassador Billingsley, the chief American negotiator, almost said as much. Uh, and so I think that push now on the American side is absence. And if you're sitting in Moscow, why do you negotiate this kind of deal when President-elect Biden has been clear that he wants an extension and without conditions? And Tony Blinken, who yesterday was uh, named as the president-elect's nominee for secretary of state, has said that the president-elect would intend to extend New START for five years. Russia has no incentive. So uh, I think this waits until after uh, we have a President Biden in January. They then have to move very quickly. They have two weeks uh, to extend the treaty. Uh, but I think that's what's going to happen. Well, let me just say in the late 1980s, I was um, the deputy director for verification in the office of the Secretary of Defense when these Votinsk procedures and so forth were being negotiated. And I can confirm or just reaffirm what you've said. They were very, very complex and it took a lot of negotiating time. Uh, certainly not something that one could do in just a couple of months. So, um, but since we've kind of mentioned INF, uh, let me move to a kind of a, it's a related but a separate question. President Putin has also floated a proposal of his own dealing with what the U.S. refers to as non-strategic weapons, weapons shorter and intermediate range not covered by the New START Treaty. This would involve uh, a, uh, a moratorium on the deployment of INF range missiles in Europe, along with mutual inspections, as he is proposed by NATO and Russia, of each other's military bases. Uh, to my understanding, his proposal says nothing about withdrawing the Russian cruise missiles, no, uh, specifically the 9M729s that violated the INF Treaty and, according to Western sources, have already been deployed in European Russia, that is, west of the Urals. What's the current situation then with the INF range systems? And more specifically, how do you view uh, that Russian proposal? Well, I think the big question you've already touched on is we don't know for sure whether the Russian proposal covers the 9M729. If the proposal does not cover the 9M729, then what the Russians are saying is, well, we're free to deploy 
our intermediate range missile, but we want no American missiles. That's not going to be a very popular idea in the United States or among NATO members. Um, but if it does include the 9M729, maybe it's a bit more interesting. There still are some questions, though. If you go back and, Leo, as you recall, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, in the end, because of the range of the missiles and because of their mobility, they can move. Uh, and because also, I think we and uh, we in the United States were uncomfortable with the idea of strengthening European security at the expense of Asia. We didn't want to ex export a European problem to Asia. Mm -hmm. That argued for global limits. So I think that's a question we have to think about with the European proposal. But also, I, you do have, at least on, on the Pentagon side, an interest particularly in having a land-based intermediate range missile capability in Asia. And I do believe the Pentagon has in development a couple of missiles which, because of their range, don't make sense for Asia, but may well be intended for Europe. So I, I, I'm not sure we can get back to the INF Treaty at this point. What might be worth exploring, though, is at least the American government, when it talks about having a land-based intermediate range capability, is talking only about conventionally armed missiles. The 9M729, while it's assessed to be dual capable, I believe is primarily intended to give the Russians additional conventional capability. So one question might be, could the sides work out some kind of an agreement that could apply globally that would ban nuclear armed intermediate range missiles? That wouldn't be as good as the INF Treaty, uh, and it would require some verification uh, provisions, but that might be something uh, that could be explored that would build off the idea that uh, Mr. Putin has raised. Mm -hmm. One of the verification uh, measures, I assume, would be how do you verify that uh, missiles of that range, intermediate and shorter range, could not swiftly be uploaded with nuclear weapons? So that, and that's not a, a simple problem to, uh, to prevent. So that's exactly right. There, there would be some challenges. I, I'm not sure they're insoluble, though. I mean, perhaps, for example, if you had an agreement that said you could, add, you could not have nuclear weapons stored at bases where the missiles were, they couldn't be co-located, so at least you would require a certain amount of time. And, and I think the sites have developed technologies now that can be used to verify that warheads were conventional. And, and we use some of these technologies for now, for example, now in monitoring the uh, new START treaty. Um, you stated in your article that traditional nuclear arms control is in trouble. And the challenges of trade-offs that you mentioned in your article are indeed daunting. Um, a, a friend and colleague of, of yours, I know a little bit professionally, Rose Gottmuller, the former NATO and administration official and arms control expert, seems to share your assessment on that. And the two of you seem to agree or do agree that extending the New Star Treaty would be vital to regain some of the momentum towards arms control that both serve U.S. national security interests and broader global interests in nonproliferation and risk reduction. Ms. Gottmuller also comments on what has become a rather partisan divide over arms control in the US. And she writes, let me just quote two sentences from that article. Quote, we have seen over the past two decades a whipsaw effect in our national approach. When the Democrats are in power, they do what they can to build up arms control regimes. When the Republicans are in power, they do what they can to dismantle them. End quote. So looking ahead, to the future Biden administration. What recommendations could you make to overcome or at least diminish the partisan divide, not only on arms control, but frankly on the overall approach that the US should take toward Russia? Well, I, I think first of all, I'd say there are some very big questions as to what comes after New START extension. Uh, you know, does the Biden administration decide, for example, you could negotiate kind of a new start plus, which would still focus on strategic weapons. And at the end of the day, that may be all that we can do. Uh, I hope they're more ambitious. I hope that they, in fact, go for an agreement that would cover all American and Russian nuclear weapons, strategic, non-strategic, deployed, non-deployed. That has some trade-offs, though. You know, one would be far more intrusive verification measures than either side has accepted in the past. And I think it may confront the United States government with a fundamental question, which is that over the last 10 years, the Russians have said that 
In order to negotiate all nuclear weapons, the U.S. would have to address certain issues of concern to Russia. And always at the top of the Russian list has been missile defense. And that may be a question that the U.S. government has to confront. Is our interest in getting the Russians to negotiate on all nuclear weapons so important that we're prepared to negotiate some limits on missile defense? I think that that's a trade-off worth looking at. Uh, my guess is that Republicans in Congress would, would not share that view. And that does get to the point that Ambassador Gottemuller made about the trade-offs and the difficulty of dealing with the Senate. And I think, unfortunately, we've reached a point where uh, arms control treaties that are negotiated by Democratic presidents are not always considered strictly on their merits by Republican senators. Uh, and the example I would hold up is if you look at the 2010 New START Treaty, and then you go back to the George W. Bush administration, which negotiated in, in, in uh, 2002, I'm sorry, yeah, 2002, the Strategic Offensive Reductions Treaty. Those treaties had roughly the same limits, a little bit different, but about the same level of forces. Uh, the New START Treaty is about 400, 500 pages long because of all the verification provisions and counting rules and procedures. The SORT Treaty negotiated by the Bush administration was two pages. It had no agreed definitions, no counting rules, no verification measures. Yet, an overwhelming number of Republican senators voted to ratify or to consent to ratify the Bush Treaty, and then, you know, only a relatively small number of Republicans voted to consent to ratify the Obama administration's New START Treaty. We've got to figure out a way to, 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 to address that. One might be is to create something that we had in the 1980s, as you probably recall, a, a Senate observers group, where you get a group of Republicans and Democrats who are involved, they, they go to wherever the negotiated side is, they're briefed on the negotiations, they understand the negotiations as they develop, and, and then you create a body within the Senate that can speak for the treaty when it comes time to consider ratification. That's one possibility. The other possibility, though, is if the Republicans are going to consider to continue to behave in the way that they have, is it may force the Biden administration to look at other mechanisms, you know, perhaps not doing these as a treaty, perhaps doing an executive agreement, which would be approved by simple majorities in both the Senate and the House. I prefer to go the treaty route, but I but I, I I worry that given the position we've seen the Republicans in the Senate take over the last six or seven years, that may not be possible, and arms control may have to find other means. Uh, so th there may be a role here for lawyers to be a bit clever. <laughs> well, um, at this I'm anxious to bring in now our, our participants. I, I want to add two small things. One is a, a point of information. Um, in January 2017, short, well, really just two weeks before leaving office, then Vice President Biden um, gave an address, made remarks on nuclear security issues, which are quite comprehensive and are interesting also because they trace his four, year, four decade long involvement in these issues. And I've asked my colleague, Maria, and she will. Uh, I've sent her the link and she will post that on the chat function so that um, uh, the participants can take a look at that speech. Obviously, the situation that uh, he, will, he will inherit um, in January um, is different in many respects than uh, four years ago. But I think it will be a, a worthwhile thing for uh, they're interested to look at. And my final question for you, just very briefly, is that over the weekend, the United States announced its withdrawal from another arms control treaty, a conventional one this time, the Open Skies Treaty, again, citing Russian violations. Could you just say a few words at this point? Uh, what's at stake in this move? And is that something that could be reversed easily by the incoming Biden administration? Uh, well, again, I, I think that was a mistake that the Trump administration committed. The Russians had violated certain provisions of the Open Skies Treaty. But it was not at all like with the INF Treaty, where they violated the fundamental provision. I mean, the INF Treaty was about you can't have missiles of intermediate range, and the Russians built a missile of intermediate range. With open skies, they'd, they'd impose certain limitations. 
But the United States, in response, had imposed certain limitations on what the Russians could do in overflying the United States. Uh, there were advantages to the Open Skies Treaty. Airplanes have flexibility that satellites don't have. For example, they can fly under clouds. Uh, open skies allowed countries that did not have the sophisticated reconnaissance capabilities that the United States does in its satellites to participate in confidence building and data collection. And you could use open skies for political purposes. And a number of U.S. open skies flights were designed specifically to signal to the Russians that the U.S. was watching carefully what was going on in eastern Ukraine and in Russian territory bordering eastern Ukraine. Uh, so I think this was a mistake. It was reflective of an administration that really had a and didn't have a lot of, um, uh, I don't know, positive feelings about arms control. They, 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 they spent a lot of time tearing that regime down. I think it's a mistake. Uh, I hope the Biden administration will look for a way to get back into the treaty. I think that would make sense. Uh, the, but it gets to this problem. If the only way for the Biden administration to rejoin the treaty is to re-sign the treaty again and then go through a treaty ratification process, could you get Republican senators to consent to ratify a treaty that a Republican administration had just left? And so this may be a situation where the Biden administration wants to rejoin the treaty, but may have to ask the other 33 parties to the treaty, can they be a little bit more flexible on the mechanism that would allow the United States to rejoin? Well, thank you, Steve. Uh, at this point, I would like to pass the uh, moderating role uh, back to, to my colleague Maria in, in Helsinki so that she's been looking at the chats now and she can handle the question period. I'll uh, rejoin you at the end of the session. So as of now, we don't have any questions yet in the chat. So if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in. Uh, in the meanwhile, um, Steve, could you tell us a little more about what will happen if um, if the Biden administration and the Russians fail to, to finish the negotiations in time? But if they still have the, the goodwill, sort of, the decides to figure out a solution and come up with a new treaty, will it make it a lot more complicated and bureaucratic to sort of start over if the present day treaty expires. Yeah, yes, no, I, I, I think both sides are going to be in a better position if they extend New START for five years and that then becomes the base. And I would argue for extending it for five years because the next step is going to take time. Uh, I, I think you will have the Biden administration indicate fairly quickly uh, that it's readiness to extend New START. On the American side, that's fairly easy to do. The president simply has to make that decision. On the Russian side, I understand that there's actually a legislative process, which takes some weeks. But Russian experts have said that they could provisionally continue the while they continue their provisions. So I think that's the first step, first new start. Then I think it makes sense for the Biden administration to launch a series of their posture. Uh, and this is something that is to ascertain does the level of nuclear force that the United States now has in China make sense? And so, for example, uh, under new each side is limited to 150 deployed strategic warheads. However, back in 2013, the Obama administration, the Pentagon said that in fact it had a third reduction in that level and still have a viable current. Now, the Pentagon made clear that they wanted that reduction in parallel with Russian reductions of, of the same amount. But that's one question, which is can the sides? Both, or can the United States get by with a lesser number of deployed strategic warheads? You know, do, do the U.S. modernization plans make sense? I, I, for example, question whether we need to replace the entire force of intercontinental ballistic missiles. But that process then gives the U.S. a basis then for negotiations. And then I think a third thing that could be done relatively early in the Biden administration would be to launch strategic stability talks with Russia, where you would talk about 
nuclear weapons, deployed, non-deployed, strategic, non-strategic, missile defense, conventional strike, third countries, cyberspace, have a discussion about everything. And at a minimum, that helps the sides understand the other's concerns. But you might also then in address doctrine. Uh, I worry, for example, that both sides look at the other and believe that the other side is lowering the nuclear threshold. That could be the case, but, but I would hope that they would have a better understanding of that. Uh, and then as those strategic stability talks would develop, perhaps you could identify specific issues for negotiation. But because the negotiations, I believe, I, I, I hope the Biden administration would be ambitious and be prepared to talk about limits on all nuclear weapons, that's going to involve new verification procedures. It may involve some trade-offs, questions like missile defense. So I, I think the side should be prepared that it's going to be a fairly lengthy negotiation. Hopefully it wouldn't take the full five years of New START extension, uh, but it's going to take some time. Uh, but that's good because it, the sides would maybe have a chance to get into some issues and perhaps begin to reduce some systems that have not been covered previously by arms control. Thank you. So we have a question now um, from one of my FIA colleagues, Yuri Lavalkainen, who is asking about, well, I'm going to read it. It's a bit of a lengthy question, so it's better that I just read the whole thing. What kind of prospects do you see for a future multilateral arms control free? main U.S.-Russia based deal. Do you see any treaty regarding non-nuclear capabilities concerning Russia, including cyber weapons, anti-satellite weapons, long-range conventional weapons? Okay, <laughs> sounds like about three questions there. Uh, no, again, I, I, I think the logical thing for a next step would be one more U.S.-Russia bilateral treaty that hopefully would reduce all U.S. and Russian nuclear weapons. Um, the Trump administration wanted to have a multilateral treaty, or at least a trilateral treaty, with the United States, Russia, and China. Uh, but they never outlined what that treaty would look like. And I think that is because they had a very hard time figuring out what the treaty would look like. Because neither Washington nor Moscow would be prepared to allow or would be prepared to reduce down to China's level. Just approximate numbers right now, according to the, you know, the Federation of American Scientists, the total US, U.S. nuclear arsenal is about 3,800 weapons, that's of all kinds. Russia's at about 4,300, and China's at about 300. So the United States and Russia each have at least 12 times as many nuclear weapons as does China. Neither Washington nor Moscow is prepared to come down to China's level, and likewise, neither Washington nor Moscow would be prepared to negotiate a treaty that would allow China to build up to their levels and legitimize that kind of buildup. And I don't believe that China is prepared to accept a treaty with unequal limits. So I, I, I don't think the treaty that the Trump administration was talking about was doable. Just a different way uh, to address China. And because I think if you're talking about China, the Russians would also insist on at least Britain and France being included. And, and the way I would go about it would be for the United States and Russia to negotiate a bilateral treaty, which would bring their nuclear weapons down. I've suggested in the past maybe 2,500 total weapons on each side, which would be a significant reduction, but it would still leave the United States and Russia each with seven to eight times as many weapons as any third country. But in the context of that agreement, the United States and Russia could go to China, Britain and France and say, look, it makes no sense for us to be reducing if you're building up. So ask the Chinese, the British and the French to say, take on a unilateral commitment that they would not increase their numbers of weapons. They could replace, but they would not increase the total number and then offer some basic transparency that would offer some assurance that they are not building up. And that might be a sensible way to start the process. And for example, I mean, the, the Americans, Russians could even get a bit clever and say, look, 
we're prepared to come down to 3,000 total weapons right now, but we'll come down to 2,500 if Britain, France, and China undertake that commitment. So I think there could be ways other than a single treaty uh, to involve uh, the Chinese. And like I said, I think if you bring China in, it, uh, it will not be possible to keep Britain and France out. That would not bring them into a treaty negotiation, which again, I just don't see how you do that treaty. And I found it interesting that although the Trump administration had been talking about bringing in China for a year and a half, they never gave for the proposal. They never gave even the beginning of the idea of what that treaty would look like. And my guess is because uh, it was too hard to do. Now, other issues, again, uh, on cyber, uh, I think there would be a certain advantage, for example, and maybe besides considering a code of conduct that says, look, we're not we're going to agree not to mess around with the other side's nuclear command and control systems. However, uh, if, if they had that code of conduct, I'm not sure I would place a lot of confidence in it because I'm not sure we would know. So when it comes to cyber and it comes to nuclear weapons, I think it's really imperative that the United States does everything it can to ensure that its systems are, its communications and control systems are resilient, that they're secure. If we do have code of conduct, that might be nice, but I'm not sure we could rely on it simply because detecting that kind of intrusion could be very difficult. On space, um, there this is an area where I, I would hope that the United States might take a harder look. You know, in the past, uh, the United States has been reluctant to get into news about space, but we're in a situation now where space is no longer a sanctuary. Not only the United States, but Russia, China, and India have anti-satellite capabilities using direct ascent, ascent interceptors. Uh, there may be other capabilities to affect satellites. And I believe that's a problem first and foremost for the United States, because we put so many of our military support capabilities in space. Early warning satellites for nuclear attack, command control and communications, intelligence surveillance reconnaissance. Um, so we have a lot going on in space. Uh, I'm not sure we can come up with a comprehensive mechanism to protect those assets. So we've got to be smarter about things like making our satellite uh, more resilient. Uh, instead of building large satellites, building smaller satellites, maybe using some uh, commercial satellites for communications. Uh, but there may be some things that could be done in the space sphere. For example, banning anti-satellite tests that generate debris in orbit. That could be verified. And uh, I think all sides, all countries that are involved in space uh, would benefit if there was a ban on doing things that would create more orbital debris, which of course could affect other satellites. Um, so there, there may be some steps that could be taken. Uh, and I would think that this would be an issue that could be taken up by American and Russian officials in strategic stability talks to see if there were some possibilities for areas where the sides might find agreement. Thank you. I'm not seeing any more questions. Can you hear me now? I'm sorry, my connection seems to be really bad today. Yeah. Um, okay, good. So I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat, but Leo, you mentioned that you might have a couple more questions. So please, I'm the floor back over to you. Yes, um, I see that the question has just appeared, but let me ask you very quickly about two other um, are the control agreement. The United States signed under the Clinton administration, but has never been able to ratify the comprehensive test ban treaty. Um, you've mentioned some of the impediments to getting a bipartisan uh, consensus on these issues. Um, do you think that the next administration, the incoming administration, uh, will resubmit that to attempt to have Senate advice and consent? And the last uh, question would be, because it's of great interest, I think, in the Nordic Baltic area, is the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, the so-called Ban Treaty. Um, there had been some hesitation now um, uh, in Sweden to proceed with uh, ratifying the treaty. 
uh, although Sweden had participated in the negotiations, Finland did not even participate in the negotiations. Um, personally, I think it's very unlikely that the, the Biden administration uh, will adopt a favorable view of that treaty. But um, I would like to hear your opinion on it. And do you think that treaty uh, actually does serve a useful purpose or do you tend to be more critical of the treaty? And frankly, I am because it seems to attack the legitimacy of nuclear deterrence. Yeah. No, I, I think the uh, treaty on a ban on nuclear weapons, it, it reflects frustration on the part of a large number of non-nuclear weapon states that the nuclear weapon states have not made great towards reducing nuclear arsenals. So I can understand the motives behind it. And, and I guess from my own perspective, because I, I do think that the nuclear weapon states can and should do more to reduce their nuclear arsenals, uh, the positive aspect of the ban treaty is that it does maintain a certain degree of political pressure. Uh, but having said that, I don't think that the treaty is going to be the mechanism by which we can eliminate or reduce nuclear weapons. Uh, you're going to have a slower process. It'll be more step by step, uh, and it will be achieved by the kind of negotiations that produce treaties like New START, that produce the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. Um, there is, I think, a, a problematic aspect, uh, which I, it sounds like I think is being considered in, in, in Sweden and may be an issue for some NATO countries, which uh, is for NATO, you have the ultimate guarantor is U.S. strategic nuclear forces. Uh, and I think there's a view in Washington, which I, I is an understandable view, is there's a certain contradiction if you're a NATO ally accepting that protection from U.S. strategic nuclear forces then to sign on to a treaty which basically says that that sort of nuclear deterrence is illegitimate. And I, I don't see how you make those two things congruent. Uh, so I think that's one issue. On the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, uh, my guess is the Biden administration would be favorably inclined to try to secure ratification. However, they're going to count numbers in the Senate. Back in 1999, when the uh, Clinton administration submitted the treaty for ratification. And most people I talked to in the Clinton administration agreed they did not do a good job of preparing that treaty. So it failed to secure the necessary 67 votes for consent to ratification. Uh, I still would argue that this treaty is very much in the U.S. interest uh, for a couple of reasons. One is uh, the United States over the last 20 years has made huge investments in what's called the Stockpile Stewardship Program. And this basically gives the United States the technical means so that each year the director of the three national nuclear labs at Los Alamos, Sandia, and Livermore can certify to the president, as can the commander of strategic command, that the U.S. arsenal remains safe. Uh, in fact, I remember a conversation I had a few years ago with the director of the Los Alamos lab, and he said, as long as I have these programs, I don't need to test. And he said, moreover, because of these programs, we're actually learning more about how nuclear weapons worked. You know, things that we saw happen in a nuclear test that we never really understood, we now understand. Uh, so we have those capabilities on the American side. We don't need to test. Moreover, uh, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, to my mind, actually freezes an area of U.S. advantage because the United States conducted more nuclear tests than the rest of the world combined. And I believe we learned more from those tests. And I'll give you in um, uh, the American embassy in Moscow. Uh, I had the chance to visit the Soviet nuclear test site at Semipolitinsk, which is what is now Kazakhstan. And the, uh, the, the, our Soviet escorts showed us a vertical shaft that they had drilled for an upcoming test. It was about one meter in diameter. And in our group, there was a, a couple of American officials from the U.S. test site in Nevada. And one of them says to me, boy, when the Soviets come out to Nevada next week or next month, they're going to be surprised. And, and I said, why is that? He goes, because when we d drill our vertical shafts, typically they're, they're three to three and a half meters in diameter. And that's you know, 10, 11 feet. And I asked him, why do you do that? I mean, the nuclear devices are not that big. 
And he said, it's not about the size of the nuclear device. It's about maximizing area for instruments so that you can put a lot of instruments. In some cases, I, uh, these instruments hang just a couple of feet above the weapon, but they get a whole lot of information in that nanosecond before they vaporize. So I think we've conducted more tests than the rest of the world combined. We've learned more from those tests. Why would we not want to freeze this? This, to my mind, is a treaty that even Republicans ought to support because it locks in an American advantage. Uh, but I'm just not sure if a Biden administration is going to be able to persuade uh, Republican senators to consider the treaty on its merits as opposed to you know, it getting tied up in politics. So I, I, I do hope, though, and expect that the Biden administration will continue to observe the moratorium, which basically every country except North Korea has observed since 1998. I, I think that that's not as good as a comprehensive test ban treaty in force. Uh, but the moratorium, you know, ensuring that that continues to apply still makes sense. We have one question, one more question in the chat function. Um, says, you suggest unilateral transparency to pro provide some sort of guarantee. However, past experience shows that transparency is defined differently by various parties. What do you imagine? Inspections? Yes, I think in the context of a new agreement, I mean, first of all, you'd want to have data exchanges. And, you know, and for example, now under the New START Treaty, every six months, the United States and Russia extend a significant amount of data, including the location of every deployed strategic missile deployed bomber in their force. Um, 2,000 notifications a year that notify changes in strategic forces. But I think at the end of the day, inspections are going to be necessary. Now, the United States and Russia already have, under New START, an inspection regime. So when an American team goes to that Russian ICBM base, within a couple of hours, they're given the saying, this is the location of every deployed ICBM, and this is the number of warheads on each one of those missiles. Now, we get to, the, the American team gets to bring that list back. <laughs> so we collect that information. But the American team is then authorized to say, OK, this missile here, you say it has four warheads. Take us there now, open up the nose cone and show us the four warheads. And the sides do that. that that's something that you know, 25, 30 years ago, the sides would not have been comfortable doing. But that's now become a routine part of the inspection process under New START. If you go to the kind of treaty that I would like to see, which would cover not just deployed warheads that are on large intercontinental missiles or submarine launched ballistic missiles, you're going to have to talk about going into storage areas where reserve strategic weapons are kept, where non-strategic weapons are kept. That's going to make both sides nervous. Uh, in the same way, though, that they were nervous about letting the other side look at the top end of its missiles 25 years ago. But I think you could work out a regime that would say, for example, deployed warheads have to be on intercontinental ballistic missiles or submarine launched ballistic missiles. We know now under New START how to monitor that. If all other weapons were at declared storage areas, we could, I believe it would not be easy, but you could come up with a regime that would allow you to monitor warheads in storage areas. And then you have a provision that says any movement of a warhead from a storage area to an ICBM or an SLBM or between storage areas, that has to be pre-notified. And you then create a system where any warhead that's seen outside of an ICBM, not on an ICBM or not on a submarine launched ballistic missile, and it's not in a storage area and it's not notified, is a violation. Now, would that be perfect? No, I mean, you couldn't guarantee that the Russians might hide a couple of hundred warheads out in the Ural Mountains or that the Americans might hide a couple of warheads at some undeclared storage site. But in the context of an agreement where each side had 2,500 total weapons, I don't think that would matter much in strategic terms. But I think you can begin to narrow the issue. You can begin to use inspections uh, that would allow the sides to begin to have greater confidence that they could, in fact, monitor weapons that were not on intercontinental ballistic missiles or submarine launched ballistic missiles and begin to develop some systems uh, that would give you confidence in effective verification. And the standard I use for effective verification goes back to the 1980s. And it's a fairly important term because it doesn't mean you can catch every violation, but effective verification means that you can catch a military significant violation 
in time to take steps to counter it so that you would not be at a military disadvantage. And I think with that standard, there are some things that you could do that you know would allow you to have confidence that you could verify limits that would cover more things than just deployed strategic warheads. I would like to ask, um, I have taken a look at your bio, and I see that your dates on the National Security Council staff seem to overlap, with, at least partially, with Tony Blinken, who uh, will be nominated officially uh, as the Secretary of State for the, uh, for the Biden administration. Uh, without betraying too many confidences, could you tell our participants a little bit, um, any anecdotes or impressions about your work with uh, Tony Blinken or any other members of the incoming administration that have already been announced? Yeah, well, well Tony B would be the one that I, I, I probably know best, although I can't say I'm a close friend, but uh, you know, he, he and I had offices that were right next door to one another when I was the senior director for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia, and he was the chief speechwriter uh, for the National Security Council. Uh, no, I, I think he has wide experience. Uh, he has worked very closely with uh, the president-elect for 20 years now, you know, and, and I think that's really important. I mean, when he travels overseas and he speaks to foreign leaders and, 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 and foreign ministers, they're going to know that he speaks for the president. That's a very important asset. Uh, and I'm not sure that uh, every Secretary of State has had that advantage in the recent past. Um, you know, so he's knowledgeable, experienced, competent. Uh, he works well with others. I mean, he was somebody at the NSC who, even when you had disagreements, it was easy to work with him. They never became personal. Uh, and he's just a nice person. I, I think uh, the State Department is really going to be lucky to have him not only as the senior diplomat, but somebody who is very much plugged in with the president-elect, you know, but also I think somebody who's going to bring a new management tone that the State Department, to my mind, very badly needs. Uh, and um, I, it, it's also, I think, a great reflection on President Biden that he has opted for experience. Uh, and I think it's a great signal to the career foreign service, for example, that his choice for ambassador of the United Nations is a career foreign service officer. And I'm trying to think, I, I think it, you have to go back probably to the 1990s to Tom Pickering to get to the last time where you had a career foreign service officer in that position. Uh, so I, I, th I think that you know, from the perspective of career diplomats, uh, yesterday was, was a good day and, and it bodes well for the State Department as an institution, but I think it also bodes well for the conduct of American foreign policy. Mm -hmm. And uh, once again, drawing on your experience, then, how quickly is this transition likely to take place? For example, the Senate uh, in the past has waited really until the last few days before the inaugural to vote on the nominations, mm -hmm. on key nominations. So the cabinet officers, at least some of them, are ready to take office on January 20th after the president is sworn in. That may not be the entire cabinet, but there's also not the issue of cabinet officers. There are um, many hundreds of other very senior officials, at least in the national security apparatus, who now have to be vetted for security clearances. Uh, some of those also, the deputy uh, secretary or assistant secretary level will need the Senate confirmation has this delay that's taken place for two weeks uh, now in officially starting the, the transition, do you think it's going to uh, slow down that process as well yeah. for the government, the new administration to fill out the ranks of its most senior um, officials? Yeah, well, well, I think the slowdown in the process hasn't helped, but my guess is that the Biden transition team, um, and I can't speak for the, I'm not affiliated with the transition team, but I think they have been working very hard over the last three weeks, lining up things like names and such like this. You know, you know, who would fill in those positions underneath the secretary, the deputy secretary, the assistant secretaries, the undersecretaries, and not just for the State Department. And actually that transition team 
it's my understanding actually began work, uh, you know, months ago. So they've been thinking about this a lot. Um, now, my guess is they have a lot of names penciled in. They'll be making final decisions. But unfortunately, this is just a fact of an American transition process. It will take time. It, it may not be, you know, till some months into the new administration, maybe April or May, until you have all the people confirmed. You know, that will take a while. So my guess is that as the administration identifies issues that are urgent, you know, it will try to advance those nominations more quickly. Uh, if it's something that's an issue that could wait until the fall, you know, and they need an assistant secretary for that position, maybe that person has to wait a little bit longer. But I think what you've also seen is uh, with the nominees, at least that we saw yesterday, they shouldn't be controversial. I mean, again, Tony Blinken, he's worked on Capitol Hill for 20 years. I think he's, well, maybe 15 years. And I think he's well and favorably known on both sides of the aisle. So uh, I would be surprised, and I guess I would be disappointed uh, if there was an effort by Republicans to try to make something out of this nomination. And it does seem that, you know, many Republican senators do understand at, at the end of the day, you know, the president should have his people in place uh, to run the government. You know, Joe Biden won the election. He deserves to have, you know, uh, his team there. And I'm hoping that uh, the Republicans may be prepared to, to work uh, with the Biden in a way that perhaps would get past some of the partisan divisions that we've seen over the past, you know, five or eight years. I'm not predicting that. Uh, but it would be nice to see some effort to sort of uh, overcome the partisan division that we've seen. Certainly the indications that President-elect Biden has given is that he would like to work to that. And, and that may then uh, help uh, him get his team in place more quickly. But historically, this has always been a process that's taken five or six months, uh, even with relatively smooth transitions. And my guess is, uh, you know, it's going to take some time to get everybody in place uh, with this transition as well. So, Steve, I, in the absence of other questions, I do want to ask one more. And if there are, are not additional questions from participants, we can simply close the session just a few minutes early. But it's been very fascinating. But um, I do want to press you a little bit now on the broader perspective on Russia. And also, I, I mentioned your experience as the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine. I know that you continue to follow the situation there very closely. Um, Relations with Russia are different than they were four years ago, and they were not rosy at the end of the uh, Obama administration. Uh, we've seen attempted uh, assassinations uh, uh, ordered from probably the highest levels uh, of the Russian government, uh, both overseas, uh, outside Russian territory and, uh, and inside Russian territory. Um, We've seen uh, a lot of very harsh rhetoric, uh, some of which has been directed and some threatening military actions or military activities, I should say, um, directed in the Nordic Baltic region. That's uh, of concern not only to Finland, but to other nations in the region. And we've seen, um, as demonstrated in the 2016 campaign and since then, and not only in the United States, very significant Russian disinformation, I would even call them hybrid activities, uh, aimed to, at a minimum, sow some chaos in Western democracies. So you've been out with the Foreign Service now for a few years, but you're, you're very well steeped in uh, the issues of those countries and relations with the U.S. Um, how would you, or is it simply too hard? to do under current circumstances. And I won't use the word reset relations yes. with Russia, but to, to try to find a better balance between areas where we can cooperate uh, in mutual interest, arms control, uh, as you pointed out, should be one of these, uh, and areas where given behavior uh, towards Ukraine and so forth, it's going to be difficult and um, uh, very difficult, perhaps other in other areas that weren't as uh, conflict ridden as they were before. I'm thinking of Russian activities in Syria, uh, more recently in Libya as well. It's a broad question, but perhaps uh, 
if we don't have any other questions yeah. uh, from our participants, we could close out with uh, your reflections on that. Okay. Well, I think, yeah, no, the starting point is that we have to recognize the relationship between the United States and Russia and between, more broadly, between the West and Russia is at its lowest point um, since the end of the Cold War. And, 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 a, and a big part of that is because of Russian actions, which I think are simply unacceptable. It, it's not acceptable for Russia to try to stir division within the United States. Now, it's an internal problem. You know, we created these divisions, but there's been, I think, a Russian effort to broaden those divisions. It's not acceptable for Russia to be assassinating regime opponents on the streets of Western European cities. Uh, and so we've got to find a way to, to deal with that. And we have to understand that the relationship is going to be difficult. And we have to understand that I think Vladimir Putin has came to a conclusion at some time ago that his relationship with the West is going to be primarily adversarial. Now, having said that, uh, I, I think it was pretty clear that the Russians wanted to see Donald Trump reelected. Uh, that was perfectly understandable. If you're sitting in the Kremlin and you have an American president who is dividing Americans, who is undermining alliances such as NATO, who refuses to criticize Russian misbehavior, what's not to like? <laughs> I mean, you, you know, they wanted to see Trump reelected, I'm certain. But I don't think a Biden presidency is necessarily going to be a bad thing for Russia. And let me give you three or four ways why I think it could be good. First of all, the Biden presidency will be predictable. If you look at the last four years, the hardest job in the world in Moscow must have been the America watcher. Because how do you reconcile an American policy which continued to be pretty tough to Russia? It applied sanctions. It continued to support a stronger American and NATO military presence in the Baltic region. It continued to support Ukraine, including providing lethal military assistance to Ukraine. How do you reconcile that with an American president who talked about a good relationship with Russia, very rarely criticized Vladimir Putin, and very rarely criticized uh, Russian misbehavior? It didn't. And then at the end of the day, really didn't engage with the Russians in a serious way. I mean, is there anything of consequence that the discussions between Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin have produced over the last four years? I, I would argue no. So first of all, it's going to be predictable. Now, the president is going to be aligned with his administration's policy in a way that has not been the case the last four years. Now, the Russians may not like aspects of that policy, but they're going to understand the policy. Second, uh, I, I think that with a, president, a Biden presidency, you'll see a move to professionalize the dialogue at senior levels. So at some point, I think, you know, this is not this, it's not a reset, but at some point you are going to have meetings between President Biden and President Putin. But A, they're going to be prepared in advance. And President Biden will come into the room having studied the issues. He's not going to come in and just go off of his gut. He'll be prepared to talk about those issues in an informed and competent manner in a way we haven't seen in the past four years. Now, again, that's not saying that Biden and Putin will agree on everything. They're going to disagree on a lot. But it's a kind of conversation that Putin could not have with the American president for the last four years. A third reason, I think, that this could be beneficial, and we've talked about it already with arms control, is that, well, a Biden presidency will push back against Russian misbehavior in places like Ukraine. Uh, I think the Biden presidency also understands the need to have certain guardrails to have certain constraints on the U.S.-Russia competition. So we've already seen, it, they've been very clear, the incoming administration will be prepared to extend the New START Treaty for five years. It will be prepared to look at other arms control issues that could control the competitive or the adversarial aspects of the U.S.-Russia relationship. Uh, that probably should be of interest to Russia because despite our differences on a lot of questions, I think both sides have an interest in constraining their competition in some areas. And this could go over into other issues. I mean, uh, you know, are there things that you could do? If you look at Europe, um, I'm concerned that in Europe, uh, you see a breakdown in communications between NATO and Russia. You say, see much more frequent interactions between 
NATO and Russian aircraft and warships than you saw, say, seven years ago. And that creates always the possibility for accident, for an incident that could spiral out of control. Can you find a way to control that? Um, I, I've, I've worked in a track two conversation with uh, some a lot of Americans and some Russians and some other Europeans, and I think we'll have some ideas coming out in the next couple of weeks that might be considered by the sides to reduce those kinds of risks. So I, I think that there would be some advantages to Moscow to engaging with the Biden presidency uh, that you know they haven't maybe thought through yet, and it may be a different dialogue, and I would argue in some ways perhaps a better dialogue than they've had with Donald Trump. Now, there's still going to be some big issues. Uh, I think Ukraine, uh, as we've as has been said by American officials the past four years, the, the biggest single issue that's going to hold back a more positive movement in U.S.-Russia relations is the conflict now ongoing in Donbass, where you have Russian military forces and Russian proxy forces in Donbass. But even there, I wonder, could a more engaged American president who would study the issues, who would be familiar with the issues, could he engage alongside you know, the Germans and the French who tried to broker a settlement? Would that change the game board in a way that you know might make progress possible that we haven't seen over the last five or six years? So, yes, I, I think... Uh, President like Biden ha ha has said some things about being prepared to push back against Russian misbehavior, as he should. But also, there may be some possibilities for dialogue uh, that could begin to chip away at some of these problems. Again, I don't think it's going to be fast movement. I think a lot of these problems are going to take a, a long time to resolve. Uh, but there's the kind of engagement, and, and I think maybe it's the kind of engagement you go back to, say, the early 1980s at the beginning of Ronald Reagan's term, uh, before he was dealing with Mikhail Gorbachev, where you begin talking about issues, and the first several years of that conversation were not pleasant. But I think the first years of those conversations then enabled progress later on when some possibilities were open and the size sees those possibilities. Well, Steve, that was a very, very interesting set of remarks, and I haven't Personally, I, I haven't heard uh, uh, that type of analysis and perhaps even a trace of optimism there um, with regard to future Congress. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the future administration, the incoming administration of relations with Russia. So uh, at this point, I wanted to thank you very much. Um, and we will look forward to a fourth uh, Transatlantic Currents webinar, uh, hopefully sometime in December, if not certainly um, in January before the new administration takes office on a topic yet to be decided, and I'm sure that will be posted uh, to time on the FIA website. And thank you very much for me moderating here in Washington. Uh, and um, now that it's um, you're three hours ahead of us <laughs> or behind us, I should say, on the West Coast, thank you so much for getting up early and giving us such uh, interesting and informative information.